Hi, welcome back. So today we're going to be talking about the types of disabilities that are identified by IDEA. That's the Individuals with Disabilities in Education Act and um, therefore the Department of the Federal Department of Education. So let's see what we got to start off with here. Um, so the first one we're going to talk about that's identified again by um, IDEA is um, autism. And we now really understand that autism isn't one singular thing, but it's really a spectrum of disorders or syndromes. Um, so we call it um, ASD or Autism Spectrum Disorder. And that really means that it, um, that it can be a student who um, is um, really what we call high functioning, um, can be a part of an AP or an IB class or a gifted program, um, all the way to a student who is really working on um, in a self-contained classroom on really living skills, things like toileting um, or basic communication. So um, autism spectrum disorder is categorized by two very specific things. Um, one is social communication challenges. And like I said, that could be um, difficulty understanding what other people are thinking or feeling and being able to communicate their own needs or desires, um, all the way to being completely nonverbal, um, and restricted repetitive behaviors. And that can, again, can manifest in different ways. Um, they, um, including things like stemming, which is repetitive motions um, that you can see where maybe hand flapping um, or moving the head side to side. Um, it can also be manifest in um, a fixation on a particular subject area um, or idea. So sometimes we see with students with autism um, this idea that they um, really want to only talk about or study one particular thing. I had a student one time who um, really loved tornadoes. So in my art class, um, he drew tornadoes over and over and over again. It didn't matter what we were doing. If we were drawing animals and doing paintings, um, he would do a painting of a tornado. So, um, and that was an example of this restricted repetitive behavior. Um, a lot of times there's a lot of comorbidity with ASD. Um, we'll see things like sensory issues um, that can be sensitivity to loud noises or um, stimulating environments where there's just lots of sound going on. It could also be visual. Um, if there's um, a lot of um, things on the walls or um, things happening, motions around them. It could be the feeling of the fabric of their clothing. Um, they may or may not want to participate in um, in things that are messy or dirty. It could be, um, it could indicate um, some issues with eating and food, depending on what kinds of, how the sensory, these issues develop. And again, it's not with every student with ASD, but it's um, a common occurrence. Um, we talked about stimming behaviors, um, difficulty understanding points of views of others, um, and language delays often um, occur with ASD. So this one is, um, autism is becoming a lot more common. We hear um, this diagnosis in the last 20 years has really skyrocketed. I think that's not due to maybe, not due to a further occurrence of the, of the syndrome, but we're getting better at identifying it and providing support for those students who need it. Um, but it's going to be really common to see um, students um, on the spectrum in any class that you teach, whether you're teaching um, standard, advanced, um, or a multi-ability um, age group. Okay, the next one we're going to talk about are emotional disturbances. Um, sometimes we call these behavior disorders to focus really on what we're seeing from the students rather than what um, might be happening inside, although that's important. Um, in schools, we want to focus on those behaviors that we can change. So um, these um, can be a result of personal and or social problems. Um, and one way to really think about this are um, externalizing versus internalizing disorders. So externalizing disorders are students who take their emotions or their inner self and really um, externalize and push those feelings outwards. So oftentimes we see lots of aggression um, or acting out. Um, these are the students who, um, before they're diagnosed, might be um, being a lot of behavioral issues. So things like um, expulsions and suspensions due to violence or outbursts. And they have a difficulty kind of ex um, controlling their expression of emotion. Um, internalizing emotional disturbances, on the other hand, um, tend to be um, students with, with anxiety or depression. So those students that take all of their feelings and turn them inwards. So it's a more self-destructive type of behaviors. 
And we define um, emotional disturbance um, from IDEA um, with an inability to learn not caused by um, other physical problems. So a student with anxiety um, might be homesick a lot with a stomach ache, um, and that might be due to their anxiety, not due to a gastrointestinal like specific issue or syndrome. Um, they can also, this can also both external and internalization can cause um, social difficulties with teachers and or peers. Um, inappropriate behaviors, um, general per pervasive um, depression or happiness, um, and a tendency to develop these physical situations in, in response to anxiety. So um, this is, again, we're seeing more and more of these problems younger and younger in students. Um, there's a lot of theories about this. Um, one might be that we're getting better at identifying, and I think that's good. Um, on the other hand, we might think about the systems of, um, of accountability and testing that we're putting students into and a lack of developmentally appropriate schooling situations that are causing greater levels of anxiety um, among children that could be causing a greater occurrence of these types of behaviors. Um, I want to take a note here and talk a little bit about suicide and depression. Um, again, this is something that's becoming unfortunately a lot more common in our schools. And um, in all of my classes, I like to just um, make a note of what these signs of suicidal tendencies or ideations are for teachers. Um, it's things about like anytime you hear a student talking about wanting to die or killing themselves, even if it's a joke or you think it might be a joke. Um, looking for ways to kill themselves is a huge red flag. Talking about being hopeless or having no reason to live, being trapped, being in pain, being a burden to others. Um, increasing use of drugs or alcohol can be a warning sign. Um, acting anxious, behaving recklessly, um, sleep, if you notice them sleeping a lot more or, um, or not enough, um, withdrawing or isolating themselves, um, showing rage, um, sh mood strings, um, and uh, for teachers, a sudden change in grades, all of these can really be a sign of depression or suicide. And what I want you to know as a teacher or as a future um, professional working with children is that it might not, it's not your role to necessarily decide if the child is actually suicidal or not. All you need to do is if you see these things, if you're, um, if you have any kind of inkling is to report to the crisis management team at your school um, or your, wherever you're working. Um, usually that's the guidance counselor. Sometimes it's an assistant principal. Um, that'll be someone that would be um, you would know about um, as soon as you started working, they would, you could know who the crisis team was. And uh, much like you do for um, CPS interventions for child abuse, um, you don't have to make the determination, you just have to make the report. And again, um, I don't think that there are very many schools at all in this country that haven't been um, touched by suicide in some way. Um, we're seeing it as young as elementary school, so don't think that um, this is only a secondary school issue. Um, it really spans age levels now. And um, it's really important that we help um, get our children um, the support and the help that they need. Um, and really teachers can be one really vital way. And you know, as a teacher that cares and trusts, kids trust that I know all of you guys will be, um, you might be the person that a student reaches out to. Okay. So um, another type of disability recognized are um, the deaf and hard of hearing, um, which could incorporate both a total loss of hearing or a partial loss of hearing. Um, there might be um, assistive devices that, that the student uses, um, or they could use sign language, and there's a lot of debate um, in, in the field um, between these two options. Um, but the most important thing is that a child um, gets language as soon as possible. So. Um, Sign language is often one way that um, in childhood, a child can have access to language and communication as early as possible. And so one of the things that we often see with deaf and hard of hearing students is a language delay um, due to a lack of early language exposure in childhood. Um, and that really just, it of course, depends on the family support and the age of diagnosis and a lot of other complicating factors. Um, but it's important to realize that when we're dealing or working with students who are deaf or hard of hearing, there might be um, additional concerns, um, not just the hearing loss, but also some language um, delays. 
Um, we also have deaf blindness, which is both um, both hearing and vision um, delays or um, loss, um, which um, which is um, severe communication delays. If we're thinking about someone who doesn't have access to both sight and sound, um, we can think about the ways in which that would really impact their ability to um, communicate and express what they've learned, and uh, as well as gain access to that information and to learn itself. So um, the reason this is in a separate category from either um, deaf, hard of hearing or vision impaired is because um, there's unique challenges to this population of students and that they need a program that is specific and will address both needs. Okay, um, intellectual disabilities. Um, this um, is a deficit in general intellectual functioning. So if you think back to two weeks ago when we were talking about um, intelligence testing um, and IQ, um, this would be represent um, an IQ of around 70 or below. So we're talking about pretty severe um, functioning here, cognitive functioning. Um, it could also include not just intellectual cognitive um, problems, but also um, delays in social, conceptual, and practical areas. So students with severe intellectual disabilities might also have issues with um, with interacting with others, with doing um, with doing everyday life tasks. Um, and there's lots of reasons why a student might fall into this category. Um, it could be something like fetal alcohol syndrome, it could be genetic like fragile X or Down syndrome, and it can also be in, um, it could be due to a head injury. Um, and sometimes it's unknown. Um, a child we um, has low intellectual capabilities, and, and we don't really know why. Um, orthopedic impairments is another category. Um, these are some sort of disability in the use of their limbs. So thinking about those really physical disabilities um, that affect um, educational performance. So um, again, when we're talking about IDEA here, we're talking about things that would affect an IEP, um, this would have to be an orthopedic impairment that would affect your um, educational performance. Um, it could include things like cerebral palsy, amputations, burns, um, the results of polio um, or fractures or a tendency to have fractures um, of the bones. Um, and again, this might impact educational performance in classes like PE or art, um, where there's physical things that need to be done. It might include um, preferential seating and those types of things in classrooms. Um, we have other health impairments. This is another huge category for IDEA, and this includes everything that's kind of not in other things. Um, these are conditions that limit strength, vitality, or alertness that affect academic performance. So lots of times we could have a student, let's say, who has leukemia, who's going through lots of treatments, and they might need a, an IEP here um, because they might be missing lots of school and might be just less... Um, when, when they are in school, have less strength or um, health in order to learn in the way that they would ex be expected to learn um, in a typical way. So we might go ahead and, and put together an IEP, not that the leukemia causes them an inability to learn per se, but the effects of the treatments, right, um, affect the way in which they can learn. Um, and it might be for a shorter amount of time. So again, um, we could also have things like asthma or hemophilia, sickle cell anemia. These are all things that would affect um, that strength of a student in order to learn well, and they might need more absences from school in which we'd have to have accommodations to make up for. Um, epilepsy is the seizure disorder. Um, this is one that's really individualized depending on the student. I've had students um, with epilepsy who um, having a seizure is very, very rare. And so I just need to be on the lookout and know what to do. I've also had students with severe epilepsy um, where the student had um, a mini seizure almost every minute or so and um, a grand mal, a large seizure, um, usually about once or twice a day. So this student had severe cognitive um, delays in functioning and she, um, she was part of a um, self-contained classroom and needed an aid full time and was really you can think about the disruptions to the brain was really um, limited in her cognitive functioning because of the disruptions to her brain. Um, diabetes is another really common one um, for students with diabetes. Um, and you can see um, in the picture there, there's a student with a diabetic monitor um, that it was hooked up with a pump. Um, 
for students with diabetes, um, it might be as simple as needing to check their glucose levels before they take a test, just to make sure that they are um, ready to take that test and, and in a good functioning place for that. And then the, probably the largest category um, of this section um, in our schools is students with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So I have a whole slide on this one because it's pretty important. Um, we see it a lot. Um, it's ADHD stands for Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, and there's three different types um, according to the new um, mandate or new guidelines from the American Psychological Association. So we have the inattentive type, the hyperactive type, and the combined type. So I think we're most probably um, familiar with the hyperactive ADHD child who um, has trouble with fidgeting and impulsivity and, and moving around and it just feels like they're constantly have a motor behind them is one way we describe it, right? Um, but um, I think the, another type that of ADHD that we often miss in schools because it's not quite as apparent is the inattentive type. So inattentive ADHD students um, aren't necessarily hyperactive. In fact, they might be um, the type of student that sits in the class and never makes um, never makes a disruption. You might not even notice them, but they're not attending to the class. They're not paying attention. They might seem disorganized. They might even seem like they're lazy or they don't care because, um, or they're not listening. I mean, it's just because they have ADHD and it makes that a lot more difficult for them to attend to the things that are important. And then the combined type would be students who are both inattentive and hyperactive. Um, so what we really see in addition to that inattentiveness um, that can make it really difficult for teachers um, where they are, where students are just don't hear directions, miss, miss, you know, whole pages of tests because they just didn't notice or they didn't notice they skipped a problem, those kinds of things. And we also see deficits in executive functioning overall with ADHD. So that can be issues in planning. So um, organization can be a huge issue for students with ADHD. Um, attending to the tasks at hand, and then impulsivity. This idea of saying things before they think about them, um, you know, getting up out of their seats, um, just not, not thinking through their actions fully. And this impulsivity can cause a lot of social issues as well as, um, as academic issues. So a lot of times with students with ADHD, we see that they just have difficulty making friends and keeping friends because they may say things without thinking about them and that can hurt other children's feelings um, or they can make the type of um, environment where other kids don't really want to um, interact with them. So it can, it's a larger issue than just they don't pay attention. Okay, specific learning disabilities. This is the largest category of any single diagnosis for um, IEEA in our schools. And then you can think about it, learning disabilities. It makes sense that these are the most affected in schools. So um, it's a disorder that makes it difficult to understand or use language. Um, that's not connected to another, another cause and not related to a language background. So um, when we say language, we typically think reading, but this also applies to math, if we think about math as being a mathematical language. And again, you might have a learning disability in reading or in math or in both. Um, we traditionally identified this as a difference between ability and achievement. So a child who was having difficulty with reading but had a normal or above normal IQ, we could assume had a learning disability um, and not an intellectual disability. However, um, this has really been replaced because what we found is that kids who struggle with, let's say, one subject reading, um, and regardless of their IQ background, um, if they're struggling with reading, there was no difference in our interventions to address that concern. So now when we talk about specific learning disabilities, it doesn't have to be a discrepancy between ability and achievement. It can just be um, issues with reading or reading, um, catching on to reading or math um, at a pace lower than their grade level peers. Um, but I also think that it's important to think about the difference as well for students who, um, who have above average ability. So if we have a student who's highly gifted um, or who's gifted and they should be reading above grade level but they're only reading at grade level, we might not catch that they have a learning disability until much later. And it would be important for a very astute elementary school teacher to catch on to that and provide them the support early on for that learning disability even though the student is reading at grade level. Does that make sense? Because with their abilities, they should probably be reading above grade level. 
Um, we can do early intervention um, for these learning disabilities through what we call response to intervention, which is a multi-tiered system of support for students um, that doesn't require a specific diagnosis but can be part of IDEA. Um, and some examples of this would be um, our most common one we really think of is dyslexia here. We also have dyscalculia, which is um, a, the similar but for math, so students who have trouble with numbers or with spatial processing. Also spatial, visual, audio processing disorders. And these are a little bit different than dyslexia or dyscalculia in that it has to do with the way in which the brain processes information. And we can um, think about students who have issues with with that processing. And this is becoming a newer diagnosis for some students and something that would also fall under this specific learning disability category. And um, we also have speech and language impairments. And these are typically the types of students that would be seeing the speech therapist at a school. Um, there's um, different categories. The first one is communication disorders. And these are just disorders that have to do with how they articulate speech. So how you talk includes stuttering, um, lisps, those types of things. Um, we also have language impairment, which is understanding um, words, listening, or expressing themselves. Um, and oftentimes, this type of speech or language impairment is comorbid with something like autism or um, intellectual disabilities. And finally, there's a voice impairment, and this has to do with issues with the throat, so unusually soft voices. Um, some other types of speech therapists work on these, these types of impairments with things like swallowing and more um, occupational type therapy as well. So speech, and ther speech impairments. Um, traumatic brain injury is another category, and this is um, due to a brain injury that's causing some sort of educational impairment. Um, and the effects of this can be temporary or long term. We're seeing more and more concerns with these types of traumatic brain injuries um, with concussions, um, particularly related to youth sports. So things like um, football and soccer, lacrosse, um, impact sports, and thinking about how to protect our students' brains. Um, especially with all of the news about the NFL and um, football injuries causing issues later in life. Um, the effects can be huge because our brain obviously can, um, affects every part of our body. Um, it can include deficits in memory or cognitive function. It can affect um, emotions and um, our ability to regulate those emotions. Um, it can affect our physiological state, so if we feel hungry or tired. Um, it really, and, and basically anything else, it can include motor function as well. Um, so really traumatic brain injury is a whole other category and um, it can also overlap with many of the other things we've already talked about. And finally, there's um, multiple disabilities and this would be um, including two or more um, disabilities. So something like having blindness and intellectual disabilities, orthopedic and an intellectual disability. And really what it means is that you need the services for both. So sometimes we'll classify a student in this category when they really have um, equal or high needs in both areas so they can make sure to receive the, the support they need in both areas. So that explains all of the different types of categories that are listed under IDEA. Um, I think the textbook does a pretty good job of explaining these as well. If you would like more information on any of these um, for educational um, impacts or what teachers can do, you can go to the Council for Exceptional Children's website, CEC, and they have great resources for teachers regarding these disabilities. Thanks. Have a great day, guys.